Okay, so welcome to part six of this video on epilepsy and the gabapentinoids. And I appreciate that we are um, spending a lot of time on, you know, anatomy and physiology uh, for something that, you know, we could have discussed in um, a one video rather than six. Uh, but uh, I think it's very important to revise the anatomy and the physiology in the context of or in the context of something like epilepsy to remind yourself of what the actual process that's happening is. Okay, uh, so... Um, we are in the process of discussing um, how contraction actually happens and how calcium uh, rising within the cytoplasm of a myofibril leads to the contraction of the sarcomeres. So this, this structure, I should have said that actually, this contractile structure here is known as a sarcomere. Okay, and uh, myofibrils don't just contain one of these sarcomeres, they contain absolutely loads. So here might be another sarcomere over here. So there are absolutely loads of these. And basically, the calcium going up is going to cause them all to start contracting, basically. OK, and uh, calcium going up doesn't stimulate them to contract. Instead, what it does is it inhibits the inhibition of the contraction. So usually, the way that you stop contraction is that you have a molecule around actin filaments. So if I take out one of these actin filaments here, so I've got one here, basically, but I'll draw another one. So I've got one actin filament here. OK, uh, well, what has to happen in order for the uh, myosin to pull the uh, actin uh, Z discs towards one another is that the myosin has to act at uh, the myosin head specifically have to interact with the actin filament so basically there are binding sites all over the place for myosin heads there are myosin binding sites on the actin mo uh, molecules so um, Basically, the way that you inhibit contraction is that you block all of the myosin heads. And there is a molecule which does this. So there is a molecule called um, tropomyosin, which I'll draw in pink, which sort of wraps around. It's a great big, long protein which wraps around the actin filament and blocks all of the myosin binding sites. So this, this molecule is tropomyosin. Okay, and basically when tropomyosin is in place, myosin cannot interact with the actin filaments, so you cannot possibly have myosin pulling the actin filaments towards one another and producing contraction of the sarcomere. Okay, and there is a molecule that regulates uh, tropomyosin doing this, which is called troponin, so we'll draw some of that on. So there are lots of these molecules called troponin, uh, which are bound to the tropomyosin, so these are troponin molecules troponin. And specifically, uh, troponin is made up of three parts. So if we now draw this orange part, uh, orange molecule in three parts, basically. Okay, so it has three major parts, and one of them is called troponin C. So we'll call this, um, uh, is it in the middle or is it to the side? I think it might be to the side. So um, let's say this is troponin C down here troponin C. And basically, uh, troponin C is the one that senses calcium. That's why it's called troponin C, because it's going to sense the calcium. So basically, what's going to happen is that calcium is going to come and bind to troponin C. So it will come along, and it will bind to every single one of these troponin molecules. If cal Calcium, remember, has gone up hugely because we've opened the reanidine 1 receptors. Okay, so now it's going to bind to the troponin C, and the troponin C will then change its conformation, and troponin changing its conformation will then trigger tropomyosin to change its conformation and when tropomyosin changes its conformation it will expose uh, the myosin binding sites on these actin mole uh, protein mo um, molecules and then uh, myosin these myosin filaments the myosin heads of the myosin filaments will then be able to interact with the uh, myosin binding sites on the actin molecules and uh, then you'll be able to get a contraction so basically that is how calcium going up uh, causes uh, the uh, contraction to begin. It basically alters the structure of troponin. And when troponin alters its structure, tropomyosin also alters its structure. And tropomyosin altering its structure stops tropomyosin from successfully 
uh, blocking the myosin binding sites of the actin uh, monomers, which construct this um, construct this actin filament. Okay, so what you can now think of is the actin filament is ready to go. Uh, the myosin filament can now interact with the actin filament. So now what we need to do is study the uh, mechanism by which uh, the myosin filament causes the actin filament uh, actin filaments to contract in on themselves. So basically, if we draw a more in detailed structure. We have our myosin filament here, and we have two actin filaments like this. Okay, right. Uh, so this was our this was our myosin here, and the myosin remember had loads of little heads coming off. So it was made up myosin. The protein was made up of a fibrous bit and a head. And when you make a myosin filament, all the fibrous bits are sort of joined together in this central fiber, and the heads stick out laterally, basically. And it, it does this on both sides uh, because there will also be, you know, there will also be another actin uh, filament up there. Similarly, on this side, you're also going to have myosin filament, uh, myosin proteins like this, with the myosin heads sticking out from the myosin filament. Okay, and here, uh, if we draw the actin more carefully, so here are the actin monomers making up the actin filament, like so. Okay, so the way in which um, the way in which you actually get um, this said disc over here to move closer to this said disc is basically you're going to move this these heads upwards this way. So this one is going to move this way, and this one is going to move that way. And the only way that that can happen if the myosin filament cannot stretch is to actually bring these said discs um, forwards. Uh, well, the, these said discs into the middle, basically, to to co co to bring them closer together. Okay, so let's look at the way in which this uh, myosin filament is going to climb up the actin filament. Okay, so now for this, all we need is a single, a single myosin head and a um, and an actin uh, molecule. So it starts off. You start off with a myosin head with ADP bound to it, and what then happens is, um, oh, it also has inorganic phosphate bound to it. So it has two things bound to it, an inorganic phosphate molecule and an ADP molecule. What is then going to happen is once tropomyosin has been removed, uh, the um, myosin head is going to bind to the actin, uh, to the myosin binding site on the actin molecule. And when it does that, it's going to release this inorganic phosphate. So you're going to get the myosin head bound to this actin uh, molecule uh, with the ADP still bound. Then what happens is that it releases the ADP. So the next step is that it's going to release the ADP. So you're going to get just the myosin head with the um, with the um, actin molecule bound, actin monomer bound to it. And then when it releases the ADP, what it does is it does what's known as the power stroke. It changes conformation. As soon as it releases the ADP, it then changes conformation. And basically what's going to happen is that this is going to, this, um, this fiber, which is perpendicular to this one, is going to pull this way. So what you're going to end up with is something that looks like this. Okay? And basically, when that happens, if you can imagine that on this macroscopic picture, oh, no, on this bigger picture, not macroscopic, but this bigger picture here, or if all of these heads are doing the same thing, what's going to happen? They're all going to push. They're, they're pushing the actin filament this way, basically. So when they all interact, they're all going to tilt this way. So this one here is going to tilt this way. This one here is going to tilt this way. This one here is going to tilt that way. And when they tilt that way, what they're going to do is push this actin filament that way, basically, because the actin monomers are going to be bound to the myosin heads. And when the myosin head moves this way, it's going to bring the actin uh, monomer with it, okay? And the same thing is going to be happening on this side. So on this side, what's going to happen is uh, these act these myosin heads are going to bind to their actin heads, and when they do the power stroke, they're going to pull. They're going to collapse this way. So these my the myosin head for the myosin proteins this way are of this sort of structure. So they have they're the opposite way around these ones. These ones are the fibrous bit is there, and then the perpendicular fibrous bit out here with the head like that. Whereas these ones are the opposite way around. Okay, so when these ones uh, collapse down, uh, do the power stroke, they're going to pull this way, and that's going to pull this, these actin filaments, which are these actin monomers, which they're bound to, which are going to be pulled with them, are going to end up pulled that way. So what's going to overall end up happening is that this said disc is going to move that way, and this said disc is going to move that way, and that's going to contract the sarcomere. And if this is happening in all the sarcomeres of the myofibril, the myofibril is overall going to contract. 
Okay, uh, so uh, the power stroke occurs. So this is the power stroke. Power stroke. Uh, and then what happens is the ATP molecule, an ATP molecule comes along and is going to bind to the head of the myosin molecule now that it's uh, undergone the power stroke. And when it binds, that will cause uh, the, re the release, the cleaving of this bond between the myosin head and the myosin binding site of the actin monomer. And that bond between them is known as a cross bridge. So this bond is called a cross bridge. Okay? Uh, so what's going to happen is that they're going to break apart, so you'll end up with the myosin head over here with a fresh ATP molecule bound to it, and the, um, the actin molecule uh, left alone now, it's, it's been cleaved off. And then what happens is that ATP hydrolyzes, and the energy uh, with, uh, with released when it hydrolyzes is used to recock. It's that is the expression used. It's used to return the uh, return the um, myosin head to its original conformations, i.e., to bring it back out this way effectively. Uh, so ATP then hydrolyzes to ADP and inorganic phosphate, and then you're back to the beginning, except that the myosin, the actin monomer that you started off binding to over here is now somewhere over here and you've got a new actin monomer over here and you basically then go through the next process with the next actin monomer because basically what's happened is that when you went through this entire cross bridge cycle as it's called uh, you've moved uh, the actin filament this way so now you've got uh, when you were originally you might have had let's say this actin uh, mo uh, monomer uh, neighboring you but now after you've done the cross bridge cycle you've got this one underneath uh, underneath you and you'll continue on and that's how you continue contracting this more and more um, okay so that is how you produce contraction within um, a uh, muscle basically now uh, if if we had, we had originally an epileptogenic focus, which was causing the uh, primary motor cortex to fire at the pyramidal cells, uh, which were going to cause the biceps to contract, uh, to fire far too, uh, far in synchrony and far too rapidly. Okay, and uh, these are good. this uh, rapid synchronous firing is going to be transmitted to the alpha motor neurons in the spinal cord. And they are going to start releasing uh, acetylcholine, so they're going to release loads of acetylcholine in these waves onto the muscle, basically. And when they release the acetylcholine onto the muscle, that's going to cause the contraction of the muscle. And it's going to cause calcium to go up, and that will cause the contraction of the muscle, basically. Uh, so, it, now what happens depends on how frequently the epileptogenic focus was firing. So if we... Um, uh, basically, um, if we remember right back to the beginning, if we have our brain here, and here is our temporal lobe, uh, then we had some epileptogenic focus which was down here, and these neurons were firing in synchrony. So basically, let's say every second they were all firing together is an example, basically. So on the second, they're all going to fire together and fire action potentials, and then these pyramidal neurons in the primary motor cortex are, were then firing. Okay, so depending on the frequency at which these are firing uh, synchronously, that will determine what sort of uh, uh, what sort of convulsion you have and what sort of epilepsy you suffer from. Uh, because if they fire very, very, very rapidly, then what will it, what will that translate to down at the level of biceps? Okay, so if I draw biceps down here, uh, so here's two heads. <laughs> What will that translate to in, on the level of biceps? Well, it will translate to uh, stimulation coming in at the same frequency, basically. So biceps is going to be stimulated to contract at the same frequency as this epileptogenic focus is uh, firing off um, waves of action potentials. Okay, now if this is too frequent, uh, the muscle won't ever have a chance to, um, to uh, relax. So basically what happens is when you stimulate it, it's going to contract. And basically if you stimulate it again too quickly, it's just going to remain contracted. It's never going to have time to relax. Whereas if, you're, if you've got a certain amount of time between, uh, between consecutive firings in your, um, in your, uh, in your wave of uh, firings, uh, then... Um, then this muscle is going to have time to relax, and that will determine what sort of epilepsy you get. If the muscle has time to relax before it's stimulated again, then uh, obviously your muscle will contract and relax, and you'll get an oscillating movement of your muscle, and that's known as a myoclo uh, myoclonic 
um, seizure. Okay. Whereas if you um, if you are, if the epileptogenic focus is sending off uh, synchronous action potentials too rapidly, then it will be stimulating biceps too rapidly, and the biceps muscle won't have had a chance to relax, and it will just remain contracting and contracting and contracting and contracting, and that's called a uh, a tonic seizure. Okay, so now quickly let's just look at the mechanisms of relaxation basically. So how, how do muscles relax after they've contracted? Well basically all that you need to do in order to, uh, to relax the muscle is reduce the calcium concentration again within the cytoplasm. If you reduce the calcium concentration then calcium will come up, then the calcium will no longer be bound to troponin C. That will change the conformation of troponin back to its original conformation. It will move the tropomyosin back over the actin uh, monomers and block the myosin binding sites on the actin filaments and that will cause myosin to cleave away from actin and then basically what will happen is that the myosin filament will uh, go back to its original position and the Z discs will, um, will sort of um, uh, return back to their original position so they'll pull apart again basically. Okay, uh, so um, the how do you how do you take the calcium concentration back down once stimulation of the muscle has stopped? So let's say stimulation of the muscle has stopped, so you no longer have action potentials propagating along uh, the cell membrane of the myofibril, and uh, therefore no longer you are, are you stimulating the dihydropyridine receptor to stimulate the ryanodine receptor in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so you've stopped releasing calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but how do you now uh, get calcium back out of the cytoplasm and into the sarcoplasmic reticulum? So if he, this is your T-tubule, here's your sarcoplasmic reticulum. The ryanodine receptor has now shut, so this is our old friend, the ryanodine receptor. What is going to pump the um, pump the calcium back into uh, the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum? Well, basically, it's a uh, a pump called. Uh, so I shouldn't draw it as a channel. So I'll have it as a pump. I usually draw pumps in as uh, circles. Uh, so here is our pump, uh, which is the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, which is uh, written circa for short. Circa. Okay, so this is the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum plasmic reticulum um, calcium ATPase and basically it uses calcium uh, sorry it uses ATP to actively transport calcium uh, back into uh, the um, back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum so basically for every molecule of ATP that is hydrolyzed by this pump, it will move one calcium cation back into the uh, back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So ATP will be hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. Okay, so that's how you relax the muscle back down again. Basically, if your stimulation of the biceps is too rapid, i.e. the uh, time interval between consecutive stimulations is too small, that calcium doesn't go ever go down uh, back to the normal level, i.e. that the circuit doesn't have time to return all the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then what you end up with is just tonically high calcium levels in the muscle and that means that contraction can continue on uh, all the time and that's what leads to a tonic seizure when muscle in the, the, the skeletal muscle is just having has calcium at high levels in the cytoplasm all the time and you don't have the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase doesn't have time to return the calcium level in the cytoplasm back to normal Okay, um, so that is uh, that is pretty much um, how epilepsy occurs, what, uh, from what ha is happening at the level of the brain down to it causing uh, these convulsions. What we now want to discuss is the GABA pentanoids. Okay, so we'll do it in the next video.